Hey, hi Facebook Livers. Welcome to our CGH Facebook Live Thursday get together with all of you. Glad you could join us. Today is going to be an interesting day because we're going to talk about computer stuff. And I have with us today Matt Reed. Hi Matt. Dr. Bird, how are you doing today, sir? I am very well, thank you. Uh, Matt is He's our guru uh, when it comes to uh, computer security here at CGH. And so we've, up until now, pretty much always talked about uh, clinical things. Um, what we're gonna talk about today, which I, I think is gonna be interesting, is first of all, what we do at the hospital to protect um, our data, your, your patient information, and then we're going to talk uh, about what you can do at home to protect your personal computer information, because Matt has some, he has, he has a wealth of uh, knowledge on that type of stuff. So we're going to hit both of those things, here at the hospital and then kind of at home, what you can do uh, with computer safety. And, and just as another FYI, um, we're working on some technology so that maybe even next week, I was, Matt and I were chatting about that. Uh, you may be able to see our faces, full faces again. Uh, we're talking about doing something where maybe we have two screens and we're doing it live like that. So um, hopefully next week we'll have some masks off. Okay, let's get into it. Matt, I kind of started the pro saying what you did here. Do you want to mm -hmm. kind of add any, any more nuance to it besides that you're the, our CGH computer security guy? Well, yeah, well, besides hanging out in the cafeteria and drinking coffee with you all day. Um, yeah. what, what CGH or what I do for CGH is uh, I make sure that we are following HIPAA guidelines. Those are the guidelines that the government sets forth um, that we follow to keep your patient data safe. Excuse me, to keep your patient data safe. Um, besides patient data, um, I also make sure that we're keeping credit card information safe, that we're also keeping uh, employee data safe here at CGH. Okay. And kind of in a nutshell there. And probably the last thing that I do is I also back up our network administrator in case he's out on leave. Okay. And okay. He, he does his best to back me up when I'm not here. Okay. Good. So like to, to do what you do, how much of it is that you kind of learn when you're on the job stuff and how much education do you have to have before you start doing a job like what you're doing? It's kind of funny. I, I like that question because um, IT security, back when I started in, in uh, IT 30 some years ago, there were security agents, but these guys were on mainframes and the security was a little different for what they did. As we evolved to having servers and more PCs and the internet, um, we started realizing that you need to have people who understand how networking works. And this, in my mind, tends to be where you see a lot of these security guys coming from, guys who used to be network engineers, guys who understand how the internet works and how com computers talk, because that's really the information you're, you're first looking at to try to figure out what's going on with your network. Yeah, so you have to know, yeah, how things flow. Yes. Yep. And if you will, and the points where there could be uh, someone outside can make contact and Mm -hmm. That so, type of stuff. So to be, so to be, I think in my mind to really be a good uh, network admit to be yeah. a really good <laughs> security person, uh, having a network background is a must. Um, up until I would probably say maybe seven years ago, um, colleges and universities started to offer security background uh, where you can go and uh, take courses on security and and learn. Um, whether it was how to do penetration testing, how to do forensics, or just how to do um, what I do, just information security, keeping the company you work for, keeping their data safe and keeping them protected from the network. Yeah. So right. So you're saying that basically the, the universities are responding to the, I guess if you will, the need Yes. Uh, to kind of make it a little more academic, mm -hmm. but a lot of folks have learned as they've gone on the job. Yeah. And I can say that a lot of what I picked up is just what I've learned through networking and yeah. just yeah. a lot of reading, uh, sure. talking with other professionals. Um, I've been in IT long enough that I think it would be 
it would be redundant for me to go back and try to take courses yeah. on security because it's information I'm already familiar with. Yeah, it's kind of like, uh, I don't know what the exact numbers are, but some, for some, some reason in my mind, 85% sticks in my mind of folks who graduate from college and 85% of those folks end up in a field outside of the major that they did. I don't know, some, it's, a, it's a pretty high number. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you ended up in uh, something that you're interested in, but it's, yeah, it's on the job. So I'm, I'm like, do you have your associates? Do you have a... I have a bachelor's in telecommunications. There you go. Right He's part of that 85%. Yep, I, yep. when I originally was yep. working, get my degree, a lot of it was, uh, networking was just in its infancy. Okay. Uh, most networks transmitted data at one meg. Uh, I was mostly, mostly interested in phone systems. Okay. And I'm talking not uh, phone systems within a, a building, but your large phone systems, your, you know, what your AT&T used to use back in the day. Okay. Is what uh, I kind of cut my teeth on. Okay. All right. But yeah, as okay. I graduated and was looking for a job, it's like, oh, hey, I yeah. kind of like computer support and I like doing this. Yeah. So yeah. Here we are. <laughs> Here we are. All right. So uh, I'm guessing the folks who are listening have heard about these, uh, ra these ransom Ransomware? ransomware and how hospitals and others but mainly hospitals get it attacked and that there's issues with that can you kind of just give the folks who are listening and me some sense of the latest numbers on how often that's happening what that what that exactly is mm -hmm. how often it's happening and what are the dollars involved with something sure. like that well um, first to start off ta talking about what ransomware is um, ransomware is when those bad guys uh, encrypt your computer or your network system and you can't read any of the data that's on it. And the only way to get that data off of it is to pay the ransom and then they give you a key and that key unlocks all the data. Um, it is a field that has been growing, uh, I don't wanna say exponentially, but it has been growing qu quite fast. Um, number wise, Looking at some information that I picked up from Verizon's um, report, Verizon does a great report on uh, breaches every year. And last year, there was just with worldwide in regards to what was reported. Sometimes companies don't report this information. But last year, they said that there were 521 incidences worldwide of ransomware. Uh, the year before that, it was 340. So it's doubled. They expect that it's going to double again because it's a very profitable mm. endeavor for these hackers. Um, this year alone, in the U.S. in healthcare, just in the first half, there was 41 hospitals that went to a ransomware attack. Wow. Uh, my guess is that number's probably low by a little bit because not again, not everybody yeah. wants to. Uh, There's about 5,000 hospitals in the country, just to give you some sense of that. Yeah. What's the dollars with that? That took a while to figure out, again, because everybody doesn't want to say yeah, how much they had to that pay they, they had a ransomware attack and how much it cost them. Yeah. Statistics uh, based on a few different um, uh, websites I hit. Um, in 2019, worldwide, they said ransomware had a total cost of $11.5 billion, and that's in regards to what was paid in ransom, what it cost these companies to hire people to come in to figure out what happened. Um, man hours that the company lost, uh, revenues that the companies have lost. Now, in regards to healthcare, um, they say that the average ransomware incident for healthcare costs anywhere from nine hundred thousand to one point four million. Okay, um, it's I real think, money. I think the numbers are a little bit low, but um, it, these they're hard to track down again because not everybody wants to say that. Yeah, we had a ransomware attack, or if they had an attack. They don't want to say how much it costs them out of pocket. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's real money. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So, Matt, what are what are the main ways that like a hospital, like uh, any hospital, let's say, what are the main ways that these hackers get access, get gain access to the hospital's records and information? There are two ways that they like to do it. The one way they like to use the most, and this uh, tends to be ninety six percent of the time. They craft what is called a, a phishing email. How do you spell that? That's P H I S H I N G. That's P H for phishing. If you're looking, if you want to just kind of look up a little bit more about it, it's P H I S H. And and these emails are emails that look legitimate, um, but they're not. They look like they're coming from somebody that you know. And these emails will contain an attachment or a link. 
it's that link or that attachment that it contains the infectious agent that's gonna cause your problems. Opening up an email from somebody you don't know, you're fine. You're not gonna bring your okay. systems down. Okay. It's that link or that attachment. Um, and the other way that hackers like to get in is through vulnerabilities. Um, all organizations, um, some more than others, have website, external websites facing. Chances are that these websites or any device you might have on your internal network that has access to the internet um, is going to have could have some type of vulnerability that these bad guys are going to exploit. And by exploiting it, they're going to be able to take over that system and then use that as a jump off point, we call it, to get into your network and start exploring yeah. what's in your network, where things are at, and then start to track down the data that they want to find. Yeah, okay. Let's talk about the 96% of, of, of the way that they do it, which is a phishing attack. Because mm -hmm. I'm, I'm going to go a little bit into the personal computer side of this too, because I'm assuming that with home computers it's the same thing. That's the, oh, yes. the, the most likely way that they're going to get into your home computer is a phishing attack. Mm -hmm. How do you spot a phishing attack, Matt? Because I, I, I spot it because I go, eh, it doesn't look quite right. I'm going to forward this email to Matt, and I have Matt. <laughs> and Matt can say, eh, mm. But at home, you probably don't have Matt, and we're not going to offer him services for everyone in the community. So how, how would you spot a phishing attack, Matt? Well, the easiest way I, I tend, the first thing I look for when I'm getting an email from somebody, if I think it's legitimate, is I look at their email address. That's the first thing I key off. Even when somebody here sends me something and says, hey, I think this is a phishing attempt, I look at that email address. And I look at, okay, is this really a legitimate email address? Sometimes you can surf the internet and pick up that uh, somebody's all, already ran into this issue before. It says, no, this is a phishing attempt. Well, so if do I'm, you like hover, you kind of like hover on that. If you don't, if it's not the full address is there, you can hover on no, it. I, the name. The so, name. So usually when you get an, e an email from somebody, you have the name of the person who sent it to you. Yeah. So like Dave Smith. Okay. Well, I, I know Dave Smith. Dave Smith sends me an email. But Dave Smith email address is normally dave.smith at yahoo.com. Right. That's Dave's email address. I know it's legit. Well, if I get an email that says Dave Smith, but it says it's coming from um, smith.steve at google.net, okay, not something's right. not right Yeah, here. these aren't adding up. So I always look at the email address, and if the email address ends in something somewhat cryptic, like at 123abc.cats.dog.net, um, okay, this is... I'm, this email address looks funny. So I look at that email address. Okay. And most of the time when somebody sends me something, I can look at that email address and I know that, yes, it's safe. And I can then go and look at another. We're lucky to have an email filter, which allows me to get more information. Most people at home don't have one. So I look at that email address. If I believe it's legit, I'm going to open the email up. And if I'm not sure it's legit, I'm going to open that email up and look at the type if there's any typos, if there's any grammar. Um, half the time these phishing attempts are coming from overseas. And when they type something up in English, you read through it and it just doesn't sound right. They're missing something. They're using the wrong um, context for a specific word. So anytime you're reading an email and you're getting a gut sense that something isn't legitimate with this, it doesn't sound right, chances are it's a phishing attempt. Yeah. Um, so if I get an email and the email address looks safe, that there's no typos, the grammar's good, everything looks good, but there are still some links and attachments I'm not sure about, I'll hover over that link to see if it matches what's in the email. Okay. Um, if I'm still not sure, I will do some research on that link to see uh, if the internet says anything about it. Okay. Um, or if I'm really, really concerned, if I know Dave Smith was the sender, I'll reach out to Dave Smith and ask him if he sent me this email and if these attachments are safe. Mm -hmm. And if I'm getting a thumbs up from Dave, I'm good. If Dave Smith says, I didn't send it to you, yeah, then I'm going to delete it. But if I'm at work, I'm going to forward it to our IT security folks. Yeah. Yeah. Because they want to know, um, I want to know what, what you're getting. Because if we're getting phishing attack, attempts or phishing attacks from people, I don't know to stop it unless somebody says, hey, I'm getting this and it looks odd. Yeah, and once I know that, I can block that stuff from coming in. Yeah, that's good. That uh, and, and it holds at home as well as here. So, when in doubt, don't open the link. 
Don't yes. open the attachment unless you are doggone sure about that. <laughs> That'll go a long ways towards your helping your keep your information safe. So what do we do in, uh, here at the hospital internally and externally to, I guess, make sure that our patient's information is safe, Matt? Well, like, uh, I don't want to say we do our basic, but we do um, the standard things that a lot of companies do is that they will implement virus protection on all of your systems. We also run a firewall, but besides just running a firewall to say um, we can talk to this person but not that person on the internet, we also set up our firewall to scan for viruses, to scan for malware. Um, our firewall also does what we like to call um, application filtering, meaning that not everybody within the organization can have access to shopping sites or can have access to um, multimedia sites. Um, we block applications or content because there's some information that just, based on what our organization does, people don't need access to it, so we filter that out. By filtering out access to sites on the, on the internet, we're doing what we call shrinking our threat footprint. We're making ourselves looking, look smaller out there on the internet. So we're becoming a smaller fish. Okay. Yeah. And then we do some internal auditing to make sure that patient records aren't being accessed by folks who aren't supposed to be accessing them and that kind of stuff too. Yeah, internally there's, uh, besides just virus protection and firewalls, um, filtering content, internally we, we're also doing virus protection. Internally we're also siloing data. Um, by that we, call, we refer to it as network segmentation. Um, we set it up so that um, if this individual doesn't need access, or these servers don't need access to this server, we don't give them access. Yeah. So we only give access to the systems that need access to those systems. We also do that the same. We also do the same thing with individuals who access data that contains um, private health information. Um, just because I'm the the security person here, I don't have access to any PHI. I don't access the systems we use for PHI. There's no need for me to have that access. Well, we do the same thing with, depending on where you work within the hospital and what you do there. There are some systems you just don't need that access, so we don't give it to you. So that way, if your account becomes compromised, right. they can't get to all the data. Yeah. Um, what else do we do? Oh, as you had mentioned, log review. Um, we review several logs. We review antivirus logs. We review firewall logs. We review access to PHI. We look to see who's accessing it and why. Um, one of the biggest uh, keys back in the day was um, access to PHI. Why did Dr. Bird access 500 patients in one day? Did he see that many patients today? No, well that would be a key to us to say, maybe Dr. Bird's account got compromised. Mm -hmm. um, right. We also, uh, one thing that we also do is we do threat analysis, and we do that in two ways. We hire vendors because, uh, we hire vendors to come in and look at our policies and our procedures to make sure that they are matching with what HIPAA tells us to do, and that we are following those policies and procedures. Um, you tend to hire outside accounts uh, firms to do that because sometimes internally you get complacent. We also will rotate that company. We don't have the same company do it every year because they also will get complacent and won't look. Get so a second, you, yeah, get a new set of eyes. And exactly, yeah. exactly. That's good. And then we also do uh, what's called penetration testing, where we'll hire a firm to come in and try to penetrate our defenses on a particular system to see if they can get access to that data. Okay, yeah. We got a lot of stuff going on, as you, as you can tell, to try to keep things safe. That being said, our biggest risk is phishing attacks and we do internal audits, they, we get, we get uh, what would you say, we get audited, I get phishing attacks sent to me here in, intermittently. Oh, we, every two months. Yeah, our employees everybody. get phishing attacks sent to them, and unfortunately. Oh. And we don't make it easy. <laughs> no, I mean, I, no. <laughs> I, I, was, I think I've been caught before. Uh, yeah, possibly. I have. <laughs> and, uh, but yeah, it's, it's like this ongoing thing where we get these phishing attacks and we try to, help folks to learn from that if they if they get if they get hooked we let them know and explain why and 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 the big thing is uh, whether you're at 
home or work is if you get you receive an email from somebody and you don't know that sender and you're reading through it and you're just like you know this just sounds too good to be true or there's just my gut's telling me there's something wrong with this email mm -hmm. chances are there's something wrong with it yeah um, I hear that a lot from so many people where they were like I knew it didn't sound right I knew something wasn't right but I still clicked on the link anyways yeah the hackers are, are getting more sophisticated in that the phishing attacks that you guys are sending to us now to kind of make sure that we understand it tend to be people that we know so it would be one of the, my colleagues or someone here at the hospital and it has their name and something that actually has a little something to do with what we've been working on you know generic enough that I'm like oh okay they're interested in whatever and that's where it's pretty easy to get hooked but, and yeah but there's that one thing that's in that email that a lot of people, I don't want to say a lot of people tend to miss, but they somewhat overlook because they look at the name of who it came from and not the email address. Right. We flag our, anything that comes from outside of our organization email-wise that has a, a flag at the top that says, caution, this came from outside of CGH. Yeah. If you're receiving email from somebody that you think is internal and it has that flag on it, it didn't come from internal. Yeah. It came from outside, and that's a, a clue right there low there that you should call that individual up and say, yeah. hey, Dr. Bird, did you send me this email? Because right. it's right. saying here that it came from outside. Right, right. So let's transition. We've kind of been talking about some mutual things with home and work. Let's talk a little bit about home. What are some of the common mistakes that uh, people make that increase their risk of identity theft and those type of things, Matt? In regards to home, um, it's following pretty much the same procedures that we kind of follow here at work. Uh, one thing I, I forgot to mention that we do a lot here at work, and that's updates. Oh, uh, sure. We bring the systems down once a month. I know people don't like it, but we have to bring the systems down to apply updates. It's the same thing you should be doing at home. When you say bring systems down, it's not just installing the updates. It's actually log turning off the... the Sometimes in order about? for updates to get applied, the system has to be rebooted. Okay. Um, when a system comes up, there are certain data that it reads and it stores it up in memory. But once that data is in memory, the only way to get it out is to flush that memory. The best way to do that is to reboot it. Okay. Because new files were written and they need to be written back up there again. Okay. So, probably the, one of the, the biggest things you can do as an individual at home is update your systems. Keep your Windows, keep your Apple devices updated. Um, if you're running an old version of Windows 7, you might want to upgrade to Windows 10. Windows 7 isn't supported anymore, so you're not getting those security updates from oh, Windows. Oh, wow, okay. Uh, I, I don't know which versions of Apple, but there are certain app versions of Apple's iOS that are not updated anymore. So if you're running older devices and you're not concerned about them or, or what they attach to on your network, then maybe you're okay not updating them. But honestly, I would update it, because chances are you're using that device to surf the internet. You're using that device to pay bills online. You want to keep those updated. Um, next to updates, I said I don't want to miss this information. <laughs> Different passwords. Okay. Um, once a hacker gets your password, whether it's at home or at work, they're going to try that at both places. So if your computer system gets hacked at home, He's going to try to use that password on all your banking credit cards, and he's going to try all the common ones. He's going to look in your geographical area and say, oh, we've got uh, Midland States Bank. We've got um, Sterling Federal Bank. I'm going to try to go to their websites and see if I can use, because my I'm guessing they're, get, they're, they're banking at one of those sites. And then they're going to go out there and they're going to try all the major credit cards. Uh, we have a Kohl's nearby, so they're going to try Kohl's. They're going to try stores within your geographical area, all the common credit cards, to see if they can get into your accounts. So by using different passwords, you're saving yourself a lot of headaches. Yeah. Um, now, is your pa if you save your passwords on your phone, phone is, that, is that fairly safe, or would you do a different way of that, Matt? Um, I do use a password. Um, oh, what do I want to use? I do use a password app to store passwords that I don't use a, use a lot. But that password app also has a master password that I have to type in. 
So I, I'm okay with that, with using that, because sometimes it's hard to remember all your passwords. How about on the I, like your iPhone where it says store passwords and those kind of things? You like you know, you know, it's, in, you know your iPhone, it'll say uh, passwords, and you, you get the button, and it pops up all the different... Um, I can say I've never seen that. I'm, I don't use Apple devices. I can say I've never seen that, but I would like to look that up. I'll show it to you. <laughs> <laughs> Because I wouldn't mind looking that up to find out how to see how secure that I, I can say I've never heard um, anything bad about it. Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, so, in regards to passwords, though, um, people often ask, Well, I've got so many passwords, um, is it safe to write them down? It is safe to write your passwords down. Um, I wouldn't recommend writing them down at a list here at work and putting them in your drawer. Um, if you're going to write a password down, make it inconspicuous on something other than a list of ID, password, ID, password. Um, same thing at home. If you're going to put them on something, put, a, put them, write them down. If you got a safe, I store them in the safe, but don't make it look conspicuous. Don't say ID for Chase Bank, password. Right. Try to figure out a way to you can write this information. Don't have it on your kitchen it. cork board that says yeah. passwords. Don't store your password on your keyboard. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, Don't do a Zoom call with the password thing behind you there on, on the <laughs> cork board. Also, speaking of passwords, change them. Don't uh, set up that one password for that one account and leave it like that for the next year. Change your passwords. How often? I would, at a minimum. I wouldn't let them be for more than a year. Okay. I usually try to rotate mine every six months. Also, if I have the option to do multi-factor, I will set up multi-factor for that account. It's just another way that's gonna make it harder for those hackers to get in there. When you say multi-factor, that's where you have more than one way that you have to access that, right? Yes, and, and this usually depends on the website or the application that you're using if they support it. Okay. Um, an example being is, um, Whenever I log into my one of my um, checking accounts, it doesn't let me in there immediately until it sends me an SMS or a text message with a code. Then I have to enter that code in. Yeah. Um, some applications, when you log in, they'll send what they call a push notification to your cell phone, and then it'll pop up, and you, you got to OK that. Then it lets you in. What it's doing is that it knows that I'm here's the ID and password to get in. If Matt Reed has his cell phone on him. He's going to accept that push notification, or he's going to put that code in. The yeah. second factor, yeah, and then it lets you in. Okay, yeah, good stuff. And then speaking of passwords again, change those default passwords on your wireless devices. A lot of people will get that new Netgear router or that Linksys router. They'll set it up and they'll leave the default password as password or something. Mm -hmm. Change that. Um, if you're running a wireless network at home, put a password on it. If not, anybody can connect to it and see what you're doing. Okay. Last thing, two things I'd like to bring up, and they're not computer related by any stretch of the imagination, but people tend to forget this. Um, do credit checks. Your system, you could have been hacked and somebody could be using your information. You wouldn't know that until you do a credit check. You can get a free credit check once a year from the major three credit providers. Also, freeze your credit too. If, if you're in a position um, where you're knowing I'm not going to be buying a new car, I don't need any new credit cards, go out there and freeze your credit so that nobody can open up a line of credit against you. If you have little ones, freeze their credit. You tend to see this, used, this I want to say used happens a lot, but I'm guessing it still happens where people would get the um, personal information of your child once they have that social security number and that address and that birth date they would use that information and start setting up false accounts. Um, and really, it's just getting that social security number. Okay. And then they would start using that. And they would just have the statements mailed to a P.O. box or somewhere. Yeah. So you would never know. When you say that, so everyone who has a, who has a social security number has an account, or the, let's say Equifax, they keep track of anyone who has a social security number in terms of they all have a credit score? They can, yeah, they can use that social security number to track to see if somebody has set up stuff has, has taken out lines of credit against that social security number. Okay, so we're not talking a five-year-old, we're talking a child who's a little bit older who might have done that. Oh, even infants, as long as they get that social security okay. number, they can put in false, they can take that information and put it in other places, and if this company accepts it, okay, and gives them a line of credit. There you go. 
So that's why you talk about freezing your credit. If you're not, if you have nothing going on, and you're not concerned. It doesn't mean that the existing credit cards you have aren't going to work. They're going to work. It just means you can't open up anything new until you go out there and unfreeze it. Good, good. So what's the what's the future of computer security look like, Matt? Of course, if you knew the future, you would wouldn't have to. <laughs> you wouldn't, but what do you, what do you what's your best guess? You know, I, this was probably the one question I looked at because I never thought about this. What, what really is the future of um, IT security? Um, from what I was out there reading it and sitting around thinking about, is that it all talks about um, you're going to see more hooks into other things with security from IT. So let's talk about like materials management. They, they, they don't do anything with PHI, but yet. They do have PII access. They do have information, I would assume, to um, oh, other within the hospital. But it's 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 now looking at instead of just saying we need to protect patient data, it's we need to protect the organization. So now you're talking about uh, vetting vendors that you're working with, um, vetting application systems that you want to bring in. You're, you're really looking at instead of just saying I my job is to protect us from the internet no my job is now to protect us from any vendor that's going to have some type of electronic connection to us okay and it's it's only going to continue to grow um, unless we are able to just disconnect ourselves from the internet altogether and go back to paper I don't see that one happening you don't see that happening no, no not so much you don't you don't miss the paper chart days you know, that's interesting. I, uh, they were faster, but it was also a hassle factor. Like, I'm over in Morrison, and I needed someone's information, and, you know, you'd have to call the, the mothership here and have them <laughs> enter. They'd have the courier bring it over there so you could take a look at the information because you didn't have it in front of you. So pros and cons. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, uh, security, I, I, the one thing I'm confident of is that there's going to be this ongoing... Um, tit, tit for tat where those of you on the, the good guys in the security world are going to come up with things to make things safer for folks and the folks that are the bad people are going to keep trying to respond to that mm -hmm. as our CIO Randy says it's an arms race um, and, and it's I wish it wasn't like that I wish that they're these hackers weren't out there doing that, but we're, we're pretty much, those of us in the IT security field are pretty much a reactive, um, we're pretty much just reactive is what we do. Mm -hmm. What's happening, what's going on, okay, how do we stop that? Okay, we've stopped that. Okay, we see this happening, what's going on? How do we stop it? Yes. Yeah. It's, it's hard to get on in front of it because we just don't know what the hackers are yeah. going to do. Yeah. yeah. Is. Short of, of a device being able to for this phone, some way or another, when I touch it, to know that's Bill. <laughs> you know, that is him, and no one else can feel like he does or have the same whatever. Um, it's going to be interesting. Mm -hmm. So, Matt, thank you for spending time, and I, it's been helpful for me at least to hear more about this because it's always, you know, yeah, it's a, a, a bit of a black box in terms of my knowledge base, so I appreciate you spending time and I trust our folks who have listened it's been helpful for them as well um, well thanks any, a lot anytime dr. bird you want me to come by I'll be more than happy to we can dive deeper into any particular subject you want to and sounds good go from there thanks Matt appreciate Thank it yeah appreciate right, it Andy. so I'm gonna talk a little bit of COVID stuff here um, I, no no major changes from my perspective um, uh, we're just to, just to give you some sense of that we're over 5,000 tests we've done here at the hospital. We've, we uh, hit the unfortunate uh, over 300 positive cases here at the hospital. I think in the county we're in the 600 some range in terms of positive cases. The county's at 20 deaths. So anyhow, it, it's ongoing. We continue to have patients here in the hospital. I wouldn't say that that is, um, one second, I see a, a thing here. Okay. Hey, would you grab, hey Matt, would you grab Matt? <laughs> uh, one of our viewers had a question that I'm not going to be so helpful with. Um, anyhow, 
Uh, yeah, so we continue to have patients here in the hospital with this issue that we're taking care of. And <laughs> did, you, did you hear that sigh? That sigh is that it just keeps happening. And um, Some encouraging things, I guess, would be when you look at the, the map of, the, of our country, um, there are areas where it, is, it has calmed down some out east. Uh, mainly uh, out west, hopefully the fires won't make that flare back up. You look at the Midwest actually and a bit of the south and that's where still there's more activity than other places. So we'll keep plugging away at it. Um, I did read today where there was this uh, thing about uh, which was the company that had the vaccine reaction and they pulled back on their, I think it was Pfizer but I'm not for sure, and they, had the, and they pulled back on their um, on their vaccine and I, I, they have an independent panel that took a look at that and felt like that the reaction that patient had or that person had was not, come on Matt, uh, Matt's back for <laughs> encore performance, uh, that, that that reaction was most likely not related to the vaccine, so that's good. Um, I, I do feel like the, the drumbeat now is more, even these companies, they're realizing that they need to make sure that the public is uh, understands that this is a process that is um, measured and thought out and um, very systematic so that when we have these vaccines available that they can help as many people as possible and cause as little harm as possible and I I tend to think that that is that that is the direction that we're headed um, but I understand with all this we're gonna get it we're gonna, gonna get it people can be scared because they wonder how quickly it was developed and those type of things so we'll talk about that more later Matt. Yes, sir. Welcome back. This is, this is like a rock show, rock you know, concert, and, and Matt stepped out for a moment. Buddy's back to, to do a little something for us. Here's the question, all right? Sure. Great information with an exclamation point. This is happening to this person right now. How can we block or prevent this? I assume it's someone has their information and that type of thing. How can you block or prevent it, Matt? Well, if we're talking about blocking or preventing phishing attempts, well, let's just say that, let's say I'm just going to assume that the phishing attempt, attempt has happened, that they've been hooked. Uh-huh. And that their data's been compromised. And their data's been compromised. Uh, my recommendation is to first go out there to the credit bureau and freeze your credit. Okay. So that they can't open up anything new. Okay. And then I would make sure that you touch base with your, your, your banks to make sure that no money's missing. And then I would recommend that you start changing your passwords. Okay. Um, that, and then the last thing is I believe it is with the Federal Trade Commission is where you would want, and I will have to double check that. We'll post it's, this on our uh, one of those on our Facebook page, so you can we'll have an answer, a more detailed answer, uh, sometime later today. So you, for the person who had this question, for others who may have the same similar question. Yeah, but I believe it's with the Federal Trade Commission. You want to go out there and open up a complaint with them. Okay. All right. And then I think they will reach out to the FBI and. So you don't need to smash your computer. No. Um, you don't need to buy nope. a new one. You don't need to. Nope. I shake it really you, hard or anything like that. If you if you remember <laughs> if you have a vague idea of of what you might have clicked on or what you might have think, I would make sure that at least update your virus protection, get your system scanned. Okay. Um, where do they go for that? Do they do that at home, or can they go? Is there a company in here in town that they would go to? There are several computer vendors around here who can assist you with uh, making okay. sure your virus protection is updated, scanning your computer. Um, if you're one of them people like me, and you're like, you know, something, there's nothing on here I'm too concerned about. I have what I need stored safely. Yeah. I'll just reform my computer and start over again. Yeah. Okay. Good. All right, so that was Matt's uh, encore performance. Well done, Matt. <laughs> All right, thank and, you very uh, much. <laughs> hey, for those of you who listen, thank you. Have a great week. And next week we're going to talk. Uh, I think we're going to talk angiograms. So we're going to talk uh, having uh, the heart catheterization procedure done and what we do here and how we do it, and have some folks who are involved with that talk with you about that. Until then, uh, have a great week. Thanks.